So today we're going to take a look at uh, section 1.5, and this is on transformations. Now, when we study transformations, you can study them with any function you want. You could study them with quadratics, like we're going to do. You can study them with square roots. You can study them with trig functions. Once you know how to do transformations on any type of function, then you know how to do them on all functions. Okay, so what we're going to learn today is very general. We're going to use it um, a lot. So we're looking at quadratics. And a quadratic equation has that setup. It's written in the form ax squared plus bx plus c. The a, the b, and the c are numbers that will be given to you uh, when we do a problem. And there's only one thing that a can't be. a can't be 0. What would happen if you let a equal 0? Yeah? You just feel linear motion. Right, it would turn into something linear. Because if you let a be 0, 0 times anything is 0. And now you just wiped out the quadratic term. That would just be linear. Yeah. Okay, so A, B, and C can be anything you want, except A cannot be 0. The simplest quadratic you can have is this. Y equals X squared. And we're going to start by graphing that. So in the case of Y equals X squared, A is 1. B is 0, C is 0. That's the simplest one. Okay, let's put that in. So y equals x squared. When we're starting to graph something, we always do zoom what? Just to reset everything, and if we have to adjust it, we'll go from there. Now, 6. But for y equals x squared, zoom 6 is perfect. Okay. So there is a graph of a quadratic. Um, does anybody remember what that shape is called? Yes. Parabola. That's called a parabola. Yep. And do you remember what this low point is called? On the, the point that's on the origin. It can be off the origin if you move it like over here. But it still has the same name. Yeah. Isn't that the vertex? Uh, vertex. Yeah. Vertex. Yeah. Vertices would be plural. This has a singular vertice, so it's called a vertex. I think I'm going to write that down in a second. Yeah. So I'll, I'll write that down. So that's a parabola. Let's look at what happens if we replace the x with a negative x, specifically in parentheses. So let's go in parentheses, negative x squared. So it's like I just substituted in for x and I changed it to negative x. I'm going to hit graph and watch what happens. Oh, by the way, make sure when you do negative, you're doing the one below the 3. If you're doing the one on the side, that's subtraction. That's not a negative symbol. Okay. How do these two graphs compare? They're the same. They're the same. So this negative did do something to the graph, but you can't see it because this graph has what we call a line of symmetry. So that's kind of a hint at what it just did. Does anybody know, based on the graph having a line of symmetry, what this negative did? Yeah? The uh, x values that are input are burned. So if you, uh, 1 is negative 1, negative 1 is 1. So, so, what, so what did happen to this graph? It effectively mirrored the graph over the, the uh, y-axis. Yes. It reflected or mirrored the graph over the y-axis. But you can't tell because the y-axis was a line of symmetry. But that's what the negative did. It mirror imaged it. Okay. 
So as we just kind of determined, the y-axis is a line of symmetry. All parabolas have a vertical line of symmetry. It might not always be on the y-axis if you move the parabola, but they all have a vertical line of symmetry. Um, we already mentioned this, that the low point of a parabola is called the vertex. It could be the high point if you flip it, but it's, it's called a vertex. Okay. So what we're going to look at doing to parabolas is what we call transformations. Transformations include moving it left and right, moving it up and down, flipping it, and stretching it. Those are the four things that we'll, we'll take a look at. So what I want to look at first is what happens when you change the number in front of x squared? I want to see what, what is that number doing to it. So we won't worry about anything else. Just change that number. So we've got y equals x squared in there already. Um, to do 1 third, just do parenthesis, 1 divided by 3, close parenthesis. Yes? Why do we need the parenthesis? Uh, because if you don't put parentheses, it's going to look like this on the calculator. And what that's really going to mean is this, which is not quite what we want. So by putting the one-third in parentheses, it'll force it to do that instead. So that's a tricky thing we have to be careful about. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, depending on what you're typing in, but the parentheses will guarantee it'll be okay. I don't have to worry about parentheses with the 2x squared, because that's not a fraction. So I can just type it in this way. So let's hit graph and watch what happens when we change the number in front of the x squared. I want to see if you can tell me what that number does. Okay, so here's the original. One-third x squared is going to be in red. And two x squared will be in black. Yes? It stretches it out. Yeah, it causes the graph to stretch. And the way that we're going to describe the stretch here is vertical. So imagine that the parabola is glued down right at the origin. Okay? Like, pretend you're standing there. <coughs> if somebody took the sides of that parabola and pulled up on it, and it was glued down at the origin, it would stretch out and become skinny. Okay? Like, if, like if you were stuck to the ground and somebody like pulled up on you, right? you'd, you'd get skinnier. Well, the red one is the opposite. Okay? Imagine, like, you, know, you had like a piece of Play-Doh there. If it was glued down and it, on a hard surface and you squished it down, like you compressed it, it would spread out and get wider. So that's what's happening to the red one. It's being squished, so it gets wider. Yes? I just put one third in parentheses and use the divide by the symbol. All right, so what, what is the effect of changing A? It causes the graph to stretch or compress vertically. Depending on what A is, will control how much it stretches or compresses. If A is greater than one, that's the case where the graph will stretch. The bigger the number, the more stretch you get. So if A was 10, 
they would stretch it even more. If A is a fraction between 0 and 1, okay, we're not going negative yet. We already we kind of talked about what the negative does, but we're going to leave that out for now. The graph is, I, I'm just going to reword this and say compressed. So if A was like one third or 0.5 or 0.2, any number like that would cause the graph to compress vertically. Regardless of whether it's stretched or compressed, the way we always describe this type of transformation is like this. Vertical stretch by a factor of, and then you tell me what A is. That's how you always say it. So if you told me vertical stretch by a factor of 2, then I know, okay, it got twice as tall. If you tell me vertical stretch by a factor of 1 third, because you told me a stretch of 1 third, I know that that really means it compressed. But this just allows us to say it the same way every time and just put a different number in that spot. <clears throat> Any questions on what changing the number in front of x squared does? Yep. What do you mean, like, how would you say words 0 plus 3 plus 2? Like, how would that, how does that translate to the compression? This means that the value in front of x squared is between 0 and 1, okay. like 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 3 fourths, something like that. Oh, it's not just less than 1, it's between 0 and 1. Between 0 and 1, because once you go below 0, now something else happens. So let's see what happens if not only we change the number in front of a, but we change it to a number that's below 0. This is a little different than the first one. You're kind of like, we just did this with a negative. Eh, kind of. We did this. We did the negative inside the parentheses. And we saw that it reflected it over the y-axis. This is a negative that's not in parentheses. It's in front of the whole thing. So anyone have a guess what putting a negative in front is going to do compared to inside the parentheses? Yep. And instead of like looking at it symmetrically, it's going to flip it like over the um, x axis. It's going to flip it over the x axis. So we don't need to do all of them. Let's just do x squared and negative x squared. And this you will see. So x squared is going to open up, negative x squared is going to open down. So where you put the negative controls what type of flip you get. Is it inside parentheses with the x squared? Okay, it's going to flip it over the y-axis. Is the negative in front of the whole thing? Then that flips it over the x. Any... Um, Questions on that idea. So, if you have a negative inside parentheses and the negative is being squared with the x, that causes the graph to flip over the y axis. If the negative is in front, so the negative in this case is not being squared, the only thing being squared is the x. When the negative is in front, it reflects over the x-axis. And in the case of a parabola, causes it to open down. Instead of reflect, you could also say flip. Same thing. So what I want to look at is, given what we call the parent function, the most basic parabola you can have. I want to know how I could turn y equals x squared into y equals negative 5 
x squared. So I'm going to write down all the transformations that you would have to do. First of all, how many, you don't have to tell me what they are, but how many transformations would it take to turn y equals x squared into y equals negative 5x squared? Many? Two. It would take two. There's two things happening there. The first one has to do with the 5. And I gave you guys a sentence on how you say it, and I left a blank. So we're going to use that sentence. Don't worry about the negative right now. That's step two. But step one just has to do with the 5. Yes? So the vertical stretch by the top of your 5. Yep. So vertical stretch by a factor of 5. There's always two things you have to say when you describe a transformation. What it is and how much it is. What is it? It's a vertical stretch. How much? Factor of five. Now, the negative. This is a negative that's in front of the whole thing. So what does a negative that's in front cause the graph to do? Yep. A reflection over the next side. Yep, and there's the two things. You told me it's a reflection, you told me which way. Reflect over the x-axis. Any question on that? Now, when we describe transformations, there is a certain order you have to say them in, just like when you do PEMDAS. Think about your head. Pick any number you want, add 2 to it, and then times it by 5. Then do it the other way. Instead of add 2 times 5, do the times 5 and then add 2 at the end. You don't get the same answer. So when we describe transformations, we have to kind of think about the same thing. So I'll tell you the order that we have to go in in a minute. All right, let's look at this one. We're not multiplying by a number in front of x squared anymore. So we're not doing a stretch. We also don't have a negative in front of the x squared. So we're not doing a reflection. This one's different. It's doing a plus or minus a number on the end. Does anyone have a guess what a plus or a minus is going to do? Yeah? It changes the vertex's position on the y-axis. Yeah, it's going to shift it up or down. Which way do you think up will be? When you add a number or subtract? Um, add? Okay, let's try it. So we could do y equals x squared. And then do x squared, what did I have, plus 2? It doesn't really matter. So there's your original. And let's see what the plus 2 does. All right, so it did rip up 2. So how would we write this one? So to get y equals x squared plus 2, Take the original, which is y equals x squared, and shift it up to. Okay, so that's that one. What do you think the um, x squared minus 3, what do you think that's going to do? Yeah, Matt? Is it going to shift it down 3? Yeah. So to get y equals x squared minus 3 from the original, which is y equals x squared. Uh, we're going to take y equals x squared and shift down 3. So both of these are what we call translations. They are shifts. They don't distort the parabola at all. They take what you have and it just moves it somewhere else. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, why, like, I, I can somewhat understand, like, solving equations and why that's, like, important, but what does transformations do for, like, solving equations? Like, what's the... Like an application of it? Like, what, what like, do you... What's the purpose of it? What so, 
one thing that you can do with transformations, um, it's, it's a lot more complicated than this, uh, is uh, graphic design. So if you wanted to design something that you wanted to animate, and you wanted it to move across the screen, or flip, or rotate, or do something, that's what transformations could be used for. I, I think that way being a computer programmer, so that's one thing I've actually done with transformations um, to create something that's moving, animated. Um, there's other applications too, but that's just one of them. The animations that you do in programming get a lot more complicated than just shifting up, down, left, and right. It involves actually changing how an object looks as it as it turns, or you know, you look at it from different perspectives. So you might look at like a piece of paper straight on, and it you know it looks you know a piece of paper, but then when you rotate it, now it just looks like a line. So it starts to get more complicated when you when you start rotating and spinning things in three dimensions. But it's all transformations. But you can look up some other examples too at some point. So these are vertical shifts, which means something moves up or down without distorting the image in any way. Yes, yeah, I'm just describing it. So now I'm just summarizing it. If you put a number greater than zero on the end, that'll shift it up. A number less than zero, like minus seven, that'll shift it down. Now, notice here that I said shift down absolute value of k units. Because if you had something like this, you don't want to say that this is a shift down of negative four units. Down is the word negative. So don't say shift down negative four. I mean, technically, if you said down negative four, that's really up four. It's like a double negative. That's confusing. So you can shift up five units. You can shift down five units. But the amount you shift by is always a positive direction, whether it's up or down. Yep. If you had a bump like 0.5, would that be going down? No, that's up a half. Plus 0.5. Anything that's a number greater than zero is a shift okay. up by that amount. Why is it K? Uh, just, I don't know. Like, so does that correlate for B or C on the... It coordinates for C, right? In the equation you gave us earlier? Yeah, it's kind of like the C value. They never write plus C here. They always put, they just use the letter K when they describe a vertical shift in a parabola. Okay. I don't know why they just don't use the C. Um, but, yeah. And you're going to see uh, the letter H come up in a second as well when we shift left and right instead of up and down. Oh yeah, that, and then we'll hit the Greek alphabet once we get to trade. No, I'm serious. Oh, okay, we'll see all kinds of Greek letters. All right, so that was adding and subtracting a number that was on the end. Right now we're looking at adding and subtracting a number, kind of like we did with the negative inside the parentheses. What do you think adding or subtracting inside the parentheses is going to do compared to the way we did it before, which was on the end? Yep. Doesn't it shift it along the x-axis? Yes, this is going to shift it left and right, not necessarily the way you would think. So if we put in x minus 3 squared, you might think because it's a minus, you think of a number line, minus goes to the left. Uh, but it doesn't work that way. There's the original. A minus 3 is going to push the vertex to the right. 3. So minus inside the parentheses shifts it right. A plus would shift it left. Okay, I'll write one of those down. Uh, I'll just do the first one. So to get y equals x minus 3 squared from the original, I'm going to take y equals x squared and shift it right through. Okay. 
And so that's another example of a rigid motion transformation. There is no stretching or distorting happening. You're just sliding the parabola somewhere else. <laughs> but it's a little bit tricky to keep track of which way it moves. So we're going to write down what, what's happening. Let's see if I can word this. If what comes after the x is a negative number, so if number after x is negative, shift right. Like in the one I did, x minus 3. The number after the x was a minus 3 and it shifted right 3. If the number after x is positive, shift it. So H is generally the letter they use to represent movement left and right. There's your H. And K is generally the letter they use to represent shifting up or down. H and K. And both times, I think when I asked this, people mentioned it in terms of the vertex. They said H would move the vertex up or down, K would move it left or right. So if you had something like this, and I said to you, where is the vertex going to be after you shift it right two and up three? Well, it starts at the origin, and if it goes right two and up three, the new vertex would be 2, comma, 3. It's this number, comma, that number. That was H. That was K. And I was very careful about how I identified H to you. I did not include the minus with it. I just said 2, 3, because I know it's going to go right 2 and up 3. So H is just the number after the minus sign. Yes? Um, in terms of horizontal and vertical shifts, when you're explaining it, are you just, would you do horizontal the way you explain the vertical shift just because you're reading, reading left to right? I, I'm going to tell you that in a minute. Right. There's going to be, I have a a page that says perform transformations in the following order, and I'll tell you which way you're supposed to come. So I'll hold off on that for one second. So H is the X value of the vertex, K is the Y. So now you might say, well, what if I had something like this? Uh, X minus, or X plus 3 minus 4. Well, this is your K minus 4. That's down 4. But h is supposed to be the number that comes after the minus. Well, there, there is no minus there. It's a plus. So the way you could think of it is like this. x minus, and then what number would come after the minus? Minus 3. Because minus and minus would be a plus. So if I was asking where the vertex is on a parabola like this, I would say it's at negative 3, comma, negative 4, because it's going to shift left 3 from the origin, and then it's going to go down 4. 
So it would be negative 3, negative 4. So the K is a little easier. You can really just look at it. But you've got to be a little careful with the H number. It's like it's always the opposite of what you see. That, that's another way to think of it. If you see a mi plus 3, it's a minus 2. If you see a minus 2, it's a plus 2. H is always the opposite of what you see. Now, the line of symmetry. What kind of, which way does the line of symmetry go for the problem? Yep. Up and, up and down. So it's always x equals, that's up and down. And what transformation would have no effect on a line that goes up and down forever? If you took a line that went up and down forever and you moved it this way, wouldn't do anything. Yeah? Yeah, vertical shift. Plus k or minus k doesn't do anything to the line of symmetry. If it goes up and down forever, you shift it up one, it still goes up and down forever. So the only thing that affects the line of symmetry is the h value. x equals h. So these are the two things that we can use to find the vertex and the line of symmetry. Let's try, uh, try an example of that. Find the vertex and the line of symmetry. And we know the line of symmetry starts out with x equals. Anyone think they could tell me the vertex? Again, just be careful with the h. Think about what plus 2 is going to do. Oops. Negative 2, negative 3. Yep, perfect. And what's your line of symmetry? X equals negative 2. Yep. Any questions on that? Because this is left 2, down 3. So imagine being at the origin and going left 2 and down 3. You'd end up right there. Now, I said to you that order is important when we do a transformation. So now I'll give you the steps that you generally want to follow when we do a transformation. If a problem has more than one transformation in it, first check if there's a horizontal shift. If there is, write that. These are all if necessary. You might not have all of these in a problem. So technically, I can put if necessary after all of them. Step two, check if you have any vertical stretches or shrinks. I think I called it compress. Same thing. After you check for your vertical stretching or shrinking, then write down any reflections that you might have. Now, we already saw that reflecting in the y-axis doesn't really do anything to a parabola because it's symmetrical. So we're not going to worry about reflecting in the y-axis today. The only one we really can tell is when we flip it over and the parabola opens down. That's reflecting in the x. And the last thing that you deal with, this is what we use the letter k for. That's your vertical shift. So this was the k and this was the h. And the vertical stretching and shrinking was the A, and reflections were negative symbols. Hi, hello. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So let's go back. Let's look at a problem where we have more than one transformation and see if we can list them in that correct order. Um, I have one that's back on the other page.
Okay, let's do... Let's do this one. So describe... I think this might be example 6, because I skipped one. Describe how that graph, negative 3 times x minus 1 squared plus 4, can be obtained from y equals x squared. First, anyone think they see how many transformations it's going to take? Yeah. Four. Yep, it's going to take four. What am I going to focus on first in this box to get my first transformation? Yep. Yeah. The horizontal shift, which in this case there is a horizontal shift. And anyone tell me which way? At how much? Yeah. Uh, right one. Yeah. Shift. Right one. That would be your first step to turn the original into the new one. Okay. What's the next thing we look for? Yeah. Right. Um. Okay. Uh, vertical stretch. Yep. Yeah. And do we have that in this problem? Yeah. yeah, we do. We got them all. So vertical stretch. By how much? Yes. Perfect. Don't say by a factor of negative 3. The negative is different. That does something else. Vertical stretch by a factor of 3. All right, so we got the 3. Um, what about the negative? That's the next thing we would have to deal with. <coughs> yes? Doesn't that make it reflect under the y-axis? Uh, let's see. I know we're only focusing on x axis. So when we have a negative, that's a negative in front. It's not inside the parentheses like this. That would be a reflection over the x axis when the negative is in the parentheses. Yes. But when it's out in front, it's a reflection over the y. the y. Oh, did you say y? I did. Okay. Good job. Okay. Thanks. So reflect over. Um, wait, you said y, right? Yeah. It's the x. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, it's a reflection over the x axis. When the number is out in front, it causes a reflection over the x axis. When it's inside the parentheses, it's over the y. So we can't see it. We, we saw the y doesn't do anything. So we're not we're not talking about that. So that's the one we're not talking about. So reflect over x. Not one. Okay. Sorry. And so we got the three, we got the negative, we got the negative one. What about the plus four? Yeah. Vertical shift up four. Yep. You can say vertical shift. If you say shift up four, that's sufficient too. But there's your transformations. Okay. Any questions on that before we uh, look at the last thing? So the last thing has to do with the very first thing I told you. The A, the B, and the C. If you draw a parabola, and actually there's two cases on the board right now, how many times could it touch the x-axis? Yeah? Once. It could do once. There's a perfect example of that. What's another case? Yeah? Twice. It could do twice, which would be something like that. And the third case would be, yeah? Just never hits it. Never hits it. Never hits it. So if we want to know how many times it crosses the x-axis, there's an easy way to figure that out. Where a graph, where a graph crosses the x-axis, that is called the zeros of a function. Okay, that's called the zeros. It's a number that you can plug in, and it would end up landing right on the x-axis. 
Here's an example of not a quadratic, but a linear function. And the zero of this function would be 2. If I plug 2 in for x, I will get 0 for y. 2 is where that graph crosses the x-axis, if you sketch it. It crosses right at the number 2. So if I ask you, what are the zeros of a function? What are the x-intercepts of the function? I'm asking you the same question. I want to know a number you could plug in for x and get 0 for y. So that's called a 0. It's also called a root. A number that you can plug in and get an answer of 0. It's also called a root. So the root of this equation is 2. Quadratics, a little more complicated than lines. Lines generally cross the x-axis in one spot when you draw. The only way a line can cross in more than one spot, it would have to be a special case. Okay, so lines generally cross once. Parabolas can cross zero, once, or twice. And the way you can figure out how many times a parabola is going to cross the x-axis, how many roots, how many zeros it has, is by doing this calculation. The A, the B, and the C come from what I just showed you at the beginning of class. A is the number in front of x squared, B is in front of x, C is the constant. If you do that calculation out, b e squared minus 4ac, and it comes out less than 0, you're going to have a situation like that. You will have a graph that has no zeros. It never crosses the x-axis. If b squared minus 4ac comes out exactly to the number 0, then you're going to have a situation like that, where the graph comes down, touches the axis, and goes away from it, so it hits it once. If b squared minus 4ac comes out positive, if it comes out to a number bigger than 0, then you're going to have a parabola that crosses the x-axis twice. So it's a very quick way to tell how many times it will cross. It doesn't tell you where. If you want to know where, then you've got to do the whole quadratic formula. You might have recognized this is part of the quadratic formula, but it's the only part you need if that's all you want to know. And that's it for uh, 1.5. So I'm going to put the homework up. Um, I am going to change a couple of the questions from what I planned. Okay, so let me down see. Do not have to do 40 and 41. Skip those. And then... Actually, yeah, that's good. Let's look at that. So, those are the questions. I think it's 13, well, 13 problems. All right, so we'll, we'll look at those first thing tomorrow, and then uh, go over questions. Remember, I will be after school on Thursday if anybody needs extra help. And because of the half day on Friday, leaning towards at least doing part of the test as a take home for homework Thursday night.